She's a member of Public Houses and Women Defence Network. She has been working and campaigning with women for more than 10 years. She's also doing her PhD on gender and women's studies and trying to write fiction mostly about women. She will talk about the Istanbul Convention and the fight women give against the risk of losing it. The rising violence against women and children and also the racist attitudes of the government. She will talk to us about solidarity. And this meeting, as well as finding out more about femicide, which is a crime against women and uh, is on the rise and is the most widespread, persistent and devastating human rights abuse in our world today. Domestic violence can lead to femicide and remains largely unreported due to the impunity, silence, stigma and shame surrounding it. Our next speaker was Aishan, Aishan Gok Khan from the Free Women Move, Women's Movement. Aishan Gok Khan was arrested on Friday and she's still detained for the 83rd time. She faces 200 charges by the Turkish state and we stand in solidarity with her, with Aishan, and demand her immediate release. I'd like to thank Mary Davis, who's with us tonight, for organizing and inviting Suzanne Yassa, who is with us tonight. I can't see you, Suzanne. Are you there, Suzanne? Yes, I am here. Oh, but we can't see you. Oh, good. Hello, Suzanne. Suzanne is a Kurdish journalist based in the UK. She's one of the founders of the Kurdish Women podcast, where she aims to make the transnational connection between women all over the world. Suzanne is a storyteller for the Witness Change Project in the UK and across Europe, and a fellow at Bella Caledonia Media Outlet. She has a BA in Political Science and International Relations from the University of Istanbul in Turkey. She has worked with Voice of America in the Middle East, and various Kurdish media outlets as a journalist focusing on the Middle East politics, refugees and women. In addition to that, she has also worked in multiple media projects in the UK and in the US. She has written for The Guardian, Vice News, Humanitarian Practice Network and has conducted pro a project for refugees from NES Rojava and Iraqi Kurdistan and in Central Africa. And finally, last but not least, is Laura Briggs, who has joined us and is with us now from Manchester. Laura Briggs is a campaigner for women. She's a Manchester branch women's officer. She writes a lot and has published quite a few articles. She will give the Marxist feminist analysis for the reasons why femicide occurs and why domestic violence occurs. So, I think that before I read a message of solidarity, I would actually like to invite Derman to speak first. Derman, are you ready? Is that okay? Yes. Thank Can you I very... pass over to you? Yes, Mary. Thank, thank you, you for being with us. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to say uh, good, good evening, uh, all of you. I'm very happy to be here uh, and I'm very honored to be here. Thank you for the organization. And also I bring uh, the greetings of my sisters in Ankara Women's Platform and Women of Ankara uh, that we come together and we plan <clears throat> something for the 25th of November. And it's really nice that to today we are together before the big day actually, because it's gonna be a hard day, we think, in Ankara. Uh, as you all know, whenever we go on streets, uh, we cannot really uh, say what we want freely. So it's gonna be a big day, I say. Uh, first of all, I wanna start with uh, saying that my speech will be in two parts. Uh, in the first part, I will uh, I want to talk about what's going on now and what has been going on for uh, three and four months in Ankara about Istanbul Convention and what we have been doing during this period. And in the second part, I uh, want to suggest something 
maybe we can do something together. Uh, as before, uh, in uh, September, we came together. Uh, in fact, Ayşe Gökhan was also there. Uh, we already talked about something, but here maybe we can uh, plan something together, which is going to be an international uh, solidarity as well. Uh, and I hope Ayşe Gökhan will be uh, free soon. Uh, so, as you all know, an earthquake happened in uh, Izmir. Uh, nowadays, we are really uh, worried that a lot of people are still not saved. And we are still waiting for some news that they will be saved. So why I started with this uh, earthquake news is because it's also in the hands of government. Uh, we don't see these uh, na natural disasters apart from the uh, government. I mean, their implementations, their actions, and these so-called natural disasters or so-called uh, com campaigns or what the government does is really related with what they do against children and women. Their all politics are really related altogether. So I want to say, I want to start with this one. And uh, we have been fighting against the government that they shouldn't uh, abolish or they shouldn't give up Istanbul Convention because if Istanbul Convention is appropriately, uh, appropriately applied, we know that as women in Turkey, none of the women are going to be dead or they are not going to be raped or the number of femicides is going to be lower if the government applies Istanbul Convention. We agree with that. But when we uh, try to understand the reasons why the government really wants to uh, just give up the convention, we see that they are afraid of the power of women and they are afraid that the family is going to be demolished and they believe that uh, people are going to be uh, gay or they are going to be homosexual and they are really afraid and they are afraid of losing blood actually. So uh, they want to uh, give up Istanbul Convention. But when we look at the statistics, uh, they agreed to sign the convention in 2011 and they put the convention in 2014. And when we look at the statistics in 2014 and 11, the rate of femicides was lower but year by year, we see that uh, the recorded numbers, of course, and we don't know the unrecorded numbers, but the recorded number is going up and up every year. And every day we get up to a new femicide. And the government cannot protect women and children. And when we see that we go on the streets to say that we don't want to die, but this time we are taken under custody and uh, by torture, by force, uh, we are taken to uh, jail or we are taken under custody and we are hurt. But all we want to say is that we want Istanbul Convention to be applied, but uh, we are, uh, they, they, uh, they are just violent against us. And it's very difficult in Turkey uh, to go out on streets and fight for our, our, our lives and our sisters' lives. Uh, but uh, in spite of all the difficulties, we are deci decisive to be on the streets and to shout out for our rights. And maybe I can give an example. Uh, about a month ago, we were on the streets to say that we don't want to lose our rights of Istanbul Convention, but we are we were under we were taken under custody, and although the government and the police say that uh, they want our health, they want our uh, safety, in the conditions of pandemia, we were put into a car of eight women, and the car was only for two people actually, so they never care about us. They never uh, want the uh, safety of us. We know that. 
they just uh, they just make an excuse. This is an excuse. Actually, to talk about excuses, I can say that women die because of a lot of excuses. And in the time of pandemia, it has gone up, unfortunately. And uh, women are uh, now suffering uh, more uh, because of uh, psychological and emotional uh, violence at homes. So uh, we are we really want to reach out to women actually, uh, and we want to call them uh, to be together or to call uh, the numbers that we give uh, in case of uh, violence actually. Uh, when I go back to the convention, uh, as you know, in Poland also, they are going to take back the convention and Poland and Turkey are now in a similar situation and women in Poland and women in Turkey are on streets. Uh, but uh, again, two governments really don't want to uh, let us uh, speak. And I can give the example of Las Tezas. A lot of women uh, went out to streets to dance and to say that they don't want to die. But only women in Turkey are in under charge now. They they are uh, either under custody or they are uh, made to pay. Uh, for the uh, dance that they were trying to understand something uh, by it. And uh, I want to say that the racist uh, racist uh, implementations of the government are going up and up every day. You will remember the case of Ipek Ersh and Musa Orhan. Uh, Musa Orhan was first uh, taken under custody, but then it, he was uh, left free and uh, he, only uh, his job was taken from his hands, but now he is free and Ipeker died and a lot of women are dying, but the pre perpetrators, but the men who raped or who killed women are uh, free. They are on the streets and um, we want the Istanbul Convention to be applied because in this case, uh, the perpetrators won't be on the streets. Uh, we are sure of that. And if you are a Kurdish woman in Turkey, it's two times difficult because you deserve more to be raped. You deserve more to be killed. Or uh, there is a picture that women commit suicide, but we know that women don't commit suicide. We know that uh, behind this picture, there is a man uh, who kills the women, but the government uh, believes that or chooses to believe that uh, these women commit suicide. And uh, we really cannot reach the information. For example, uh, Gülistan Doko is lost for more than 300 days. And the government uh, does not make anything, doesn't do anything to find Gülistan Doko. Or uh, we want the case of Nadira Kadirova, Kadirova to be uh, solved, but the government doesn't do anything about it because the person behind uh, Nadira's death is a man of AKP. So uh, the government doesn't want to solve this issue. And uh, all around us actually is surrounded by uh, unfairness. We want uh, fairness. I mean, we want to, uh, the case to be solved. We want that women leave and no more femicides uh, happen, but uh, we cannot reach any information or uh, the system, the legal system uh, is uh, male as you know, of course, and we want to be there to uh, say that uh, all the... One minute. Sorry? One more, one more minute, Dawn. Oh, I'm sorry. It's all right. Yeah, I, I'll be faster. Uh, so we want Istanbul Convention uh, to be applied uh, in order not to lose uh, more and more women. And I have a mask here. Actually, we made a mask uh, like this. And if you uh, want, maybe we can talk about 
uh, what you can also do there for solidarity because uh, first uh, we talked about it. If you want, we can send you the masks uh, to use uh, for Istanbul uh, Convention uh, on streets or maybe uh, there can be a demonstration. I don't know. We can talk about it. Uh, and also we have a list of women who are uh, in jail now. Uh, maybe also we can send a message of solidarity to these women uh, of HDP actually uh, who are uh, in jail now. Uh, okay, so that's all for now. Maybe later there can be questions because two mi 10 minutes um, I can say this for now. Thank you very much, Mary. Thank you, Derman. That was a very good uh, start. At the, at the end of the meeting, after that we've had questions and contributions, we'll get three or four minutes to make some more comments if you want to. Um, very quickly, I've got a, a message of solidarity from Carol Stavris here. Carol Stavris is the National Women, Women's Organizer for the Communist Party of Britain. I will paraphrase it because it's quite a long message, but she simply says she's really sorry she can't be with us tonight. She's very concerned at the incidence of violence against women and girls, which is rising inexorably, including femicide and rape. She believes that the reality is that the corrupting political system of capitalism and imperialism devalues and threatens the lives of women by commodifying everything. It exploits us in our workplaces and oppresses us in our communities and fails to protect us on every level. We need to fight for our rights everywhere in the world, across the world. We need to educate, inform and empower ourselves to reclaim our lives. Very good wishes for our meeting tonight. So thank you to Carol. Our next speaker is Suzanne Yassa, who's disappeared again. I can't see you, Suzanne. I'm here. Oh, good. <laughs> so Suzanne, Hi. you've got seven to 10 minutes. Is that okay? Yeah, definitely. And even um, Derman can use sometimes from my... Okay, you can yeah. share it. Yeah. yeah, I can share with you. Okay, because welcome, Suzanne. I guess there are so many things that she can tell us. And she's from in Turkey and I'm in the UK and I will try to explain as much as I can because I'm not there. And first of all, I would like to say thank you for organizing such an important um, uh, webinar, and which is really great to mention about what's going on in Turkey and what's happening to uh, our sisters in, in Turkey. So I will talk uh, briefly about um, Kurdish women femicide in Kurdish cities, and then um, the exclusion of Kurdish women from Turkish law system. And also um, in the, and I can say actually Turkish feminism as well. So what I, we experienced was really um, difficult and I can say, but before starting and I can say some more, some of my experiences. And when I was 14 years old and my cousin engaged with a, a beautiful lady and he was, um, they were getting ready to make a big good wedding, but Unfortunately, suddenly uh, her brother uh, killed her. And it was like, I was 14 years old only there. And then it was a shocking and traumatic thing for me because as a woman, we, I didn't understand. All women there was silent and nobody could do something. And there's no justice for her yet. And then the guy is free. And then we don't know what happened, but they called it honor killing for nothing and autopsy reports came out really strange and there was no anything about honor and completely just like femicide and this is like kind of traumatic and shocking and it happened every day in Turkey so and I will go based on some cases and because uh, I am at the last minute speaker and I didn't have time to actually get ready and then I would love to bring some data and use my journalistic skill and experience and uh, tell more about uh, Kurdish women, but unfortunately, I will just briefly say something. Uh, on 16 July 2020, 80 years old Kurdish woman from Batman committed suicide after being raped and by a staff sergeant from Turkish army. The young woman was hospitalized on the same day and wrote a letter telling about her rape by an officer from, Tur from the Turkish army. She has lost her life while receiving treatment. 
And this guy, as Thurman said, he's free now, but there is no charge for him because there is a government protect men and doesn't protect women. A 20 years old woman named El Alzan was shot by her brother in the North Kurdistan by her brother. And her brother Mustafa said that he should his sister for be for bringing shame open the family after separating from an abusive, abusive romantic partner relationship. Another case is Fatma Alton Makas, a mother of six children, was sexually assaulted by her spouse brother uh, and killed by her spouse in Malazgirt Mush on July 14. She previously reported to the gendarme, but her statement was ignored because she was not, she, she was, she couldn't speak Turkish basically. Lawyer, lawyer Museum Boylu was brutally killed by her doctor husband on May 2019 in the central district of Kayapanar, Diyarbakir. All she wanted to divorce and marriage. And lastly, Pnar Gurtekin, 27 years old Kurdish woman was brutally killed by her ex-partner. Pnar's case brought so many questions actually, and we can, if we have time, we will talk more about that one. But here we can understand that nothing to do with educate, education, and it is something to do with mental, with mentality of military staff who raped an 80 years old woman. It is something to do with a doctor who brutally shot dead her wife. It is something to do with the government, government's law to prevent men from semi, semi, uh, femicide. And every year, the problem is getting worse and worse, unfortunately, and women in Turkey are organized really well, but this just doesn't help because the government has big power and play really this power well and encouragement to kill women. In 2019, 474 women were killed, mostly by their partners and relatives. The highest, the highest rate in a decade in which the numbers have increased year on year. So now I'm thinking of the figures of 2020 and the effect of global pandemic. It's going to be even worse than last year. I'm I'm sure because so far so many things happen and psychologically so many people down and then uh, and I can say that physical um, psychological and gender based violence and domestic violence and all decreased and uh, with the COVID nineteen. So in a as uh, Derman also mentioned, and I want to mention something that as a Kurdish woman, I've been charged by the government and so many things happened when I was first arrested. And the first thing that they want to use on me that because of my gender, you know, it was all about my gender. And I really work in a difficult environment as a woman in Turkey and which the, a woman from Kurdish area doesn't recognize by the Turkish government. And whenever something happened as for, from the case of, uh, from the case of Fatma Alton Makas, we understand that she couldn't, couldn't talk Turkish, good Turkish, and then they ignore her, and then they didn't help her to get, get some interpreter and translator to help her to do something, and they sent her back to her husband's home, and two days later, they, kill, they killed her. And when there's something like that happening in Kurdistan and Kurdish region, and what's happening in the uh, court cases, and usually, they again protect men and support men. And all of the, most of men in, who committed in these crimes and are outside, and we are not safe at all. And I, I can say that like, um, as a Kurdish safe, in, I, I wasn't safe in Turkey and um, you cannot do actually anything. So, but um, there's one problem I can say that so how the um, white um, feminism exclude black, black or women of color and from the, the from outside they exclude. And then I can say that there is a big problem with Turkish feminism, how it, it's exclude um, Kurdish uh, women as well, because the case of uh, Pınar Gültekin was really like, 
if you Google Pınar Gültekin and you will see that everything says that Pınar is a Turkish woman. She is not a Turkish woman. She, she's a Kurdish, but her identity is not, doesn't recognized by the government. So, yeah, here and I can stop actually. And then if uh, you have any question, I will uh, talk more. And then also I can say that uh, the children accepted and women empowering women hashtags brought uh, great solidarity among women all around the world. But um, how we can talk in the way that we can more support each other because this May is this, this month is really important and in order to combat uh, the violence against women and uh, yeah in this case it will be good to show great solidarity and help each other and then push the laws better like it's it's happening in UK as well and I sometimes do voluntary work with organization and one of the organization called I call Iranian Kurdish women uh, organization but you can see so many cases from there for example an honor killing took place in the UK so many and UK system except uh, events as a cultural norms and then say that they should respect this is the cultural this is a part of the, their culture that we need to respect but still many women are fighting against this in the UK trying to push the law the laws and then change things yeah, thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. It was very interesting, to, your, your comments about the, the need to distinguish between Turkish women and Kurdish women, and also the accounts you gave of the different crimes and femicides, the rising cases of femicides. So before I call Laura, I'd like to invite Paula Lamont to make her give her a message of solidarity to Kurdish women. Paula, do you want to do that? Hello, yes, sir. thank you, Mary. Um, hello, comrades. Um, so I'm from the Kurdistan Solidarity Campaign and um, I'm here to uh, give you a message of solidarity from our committee. The Kurdistan Solidarity Campaign sends solidarity greetings to today's meeting and our continued support for women in Turkey and Kurdistan in their fight for basic rights to stop femicide. We are proud to have built links with the women's movement in Turkey and raised the profile of the struggle being waged against femicide and in defense of the Istanbul Convention. This summer, the Kurdistan Solidarity Campaign held a day of action in solidarity with our sisters in Turkey, handing, uh, hand, handing in a 5,000 uh, strong petition to Downing Street. And we then attended a vigil at the Turkish embassy uh, reading out the names of the women who have mur been murdered this year only. Um, the Turkish state is waging war on women and the brutal rape of Kurdish teenager Ipek Air by a Turkish soldier, soldier this summer rightly shocked the country. And there was a big um, outcry about that across, uh, internationally. Um, but uh, Musa Orhan, the sergeant who held her captive for 20 days while repeatedly, repeatedly sexually assaulting her, was allowed to remain free, sparking mass protests across the country. It exposed how the state protects men in power, creating an environment where they can act with impunity. The Turkish state is determined to break women's resistance, with President Erdogan believing that they should only exist in the domestic sphere. This has led attacks on women's organizations across the country and the closure of women's shelters and other sources of support. It's also led to an attempt to destroy the, Pe the People's Democratic Party, the HDP, with leading women, including Leila Gouven and former leader Figen Yüksekdağ, detained and jailed. Some 16,000 of its members have been detained since 2016, 6,000 are behind bars, along with 200 elected, elected officials and seven MPs. More than 50 of its elected mayors have been replaced by government appointed trustees. HTP operates a co-chair system, which means equal representation at all levels of the party. But even this has been branded an act of terrorism by the Turkish state in its bid to silence women and keep them out of politics. The HTP 
the Labour sister party, Labour Party sister party in Turkey, is the only party in Parliament that is opposing the government's anti-women me measures, raising the issue of femicide. By attacking the HDP and women's organisation, the Turkish state aims to weaken the ability to organise and fight back. It fears free women. Although Kurdish women have been particularly targeted, the attacks affect all women in Turkey and the HDP organises its Women Everywhere campaign in response to the attacks, holding meetings in workplaces and communities across the country. The attacks on the HDP are also attack on women and we must stand in solidarity against state oppression. We demand the government cuts ties with the Turkish state, brings an end to arms sales and trade agreements until it releases all the, those held in Erdogan's dungeons and stops attacks on women. If anyone wants to join our campaign, affiliate your union branch, develop links with your women's organization, the HDP and trade unions in Turkey, please email us and I'll drop our email into the comments so you can take it from there. Thank you very much. Thank you, meeting. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Paula, for the message of solidarity. Do put the link in the chat box. So I will now call on Laura Briggs. Laura, are you there? Yep, hiya, I'm here. Off you go. Um, so first of all, thank you for organising this meeting and for inviting me to speak. Um, I'd like to start by offering solidarity to our Kurdish sisters in their struggle against uh, Erdogan's fascist and misogynistic state. Uh, not just now, but in, uh, not just now in response to um, rising femicide rates and Turkey's with, withdrawal from uh, the Istanbul Convention, but always solidarity in your ongoing struggle against um, the oppression of Kurds, women and Kurdish women at the hands of the, uh, the Turkish state. So we're seeing a rise in domestic violence and femicide across Europe. Um, and though misogyny is painfully transparent in the policies of these ultra right, um, far right and ultra conservative states, such as uh, Poland's recent ban on abortion that um, has previously been mentioned. It's important that we don't characterize misogyny, domestic abuse and femicide as the domain of the right. So these crimes are also perpetrated by men on the left and this trend of misogyny must be subjected to the same depth of analysis that we would afford to our political enemies as well. Um, in the UK, femicide has doubled during the coronavirus lockdown. Um, and Karen Ingala-Smith, who runs the uh, Counting Dead Women Twitter account, said, um, coronavirus has not created additional violent abusive men. These men were violent, abusive and controlling before. The coronavirus lockdown has created conditions that give men excuses and additional triggers. Um, so these are understandably some very emotive issues, but we must pursue a material political analysis to ensure that our response to women's oppression is not reactive. Um, it needs to be radical, revolutionary and transformative. So by virtue of domestic abuse being domestic within the home, within households, it's most often perpetrated by men of the same socioeconomic class as their victim. Um, so domestic abuse and femicide are not issues which fit, ne fit neatly into a class reductionist narrative. Um, instead, we have to acknowledge the universal nature of sexist ideologies. If we keep insisting on chalking it up to the actions of, you know, like a few bad men or the misfortune of a few unlucky women, then we're going to reduce a clear historical pattern of women's oppression to groups of unrelated, unconnected individual victims. So we'll be talking about groups of individuals rather than the collective. Um, as communists, we must place our analysis of women's oppression in its historical context. Uh, we must understand that the very existence of misogyny and women's oppression throughout space and time uh, since the dawn of class society, regardless of race, class or religion, um, is evidence that women's oppression benefits the ruling class. Um, so I've spoken about this at length before, but it's worth going over. Women reproduce and produce class society. So through sexual reproduction, pregnancy, giving birth, breastfeeding, um, but also through social reproduction. So domestic social reproduction, cooking, cleaning, homemaking, childcare, um, and also public social reproduction. So caring, nursing, educating, sectors in which we know women are significantly overrepresented. 
Um, and without these processes, the worker would either not exist, having not been given birth to, um, they may not have the time to work if they had to look after their own children and keep their own house. Um, or they may be too, too poorly educated or too ill of health to work if those um, social reproduction processes didn't happen. So the ruling class oppresses women to maintain control over those processes so that women continue to produce and reproduce exploitable workers and class society more generally as well. So um, the bourgeois woman must reproduce and re must produce and reproduce the ruling class just as the proletarian woman must produce and reproduce the working class. Um, so femicide actually presents a contradiction to this analysis. Dead women can't have babies, dead women can't cook, they can't clean, they can't care, they can't teach. So we have to ask what is the nature of the link between femicide and capitalism? Um, and the answer, in my opinion, is that femicide is the material byproduct of ideological sexism. So these universal sexist ideologies, the, um, the universal notion of female inferiority, these things permeate all levels of society. Um, men of all classes consume women as their inferiors, as sexual servants on demand through pornography and prostitution, um, and as domestic servants as well, as cooks, cleaners, childminders, whatever. Um, and many on the left balk at the suggestion of the working class's complicity in women's oppression. But it's precisely this working class complicity and even the perpetuation and enforcement of misogyny um, that makes it such a viable tool for the ruling class. Misogyny and extreme violence against women is absorbed by the masses on a daily basis both in popular culture and through the sex industry, with both of these presenting um, increasing violence, dehumanisation and degradation of women. All of these are now completely commonplace to the point um, where Nicki Minaj can release a song called Wet Ass Bussy with very sexually violent lyrics and nobody bats an eyelid. So um, with thanks to liberal choice feminism as well, uh, any challenge to this narrative is now an affront to women's autonomous, empowering self-exploitation. And thanks to Western liberal feminism, again, the plight of women around the world is being silenced in favor of debates about identities and, and pronouns. <coughs> so um, in this way, we drift to new heights of vicious and contemptuous misogyny instead of the uh, sort of paternalistic misogyny of the past. Um, into this realm of sexism, where the rate of rape prosecution and conviction is so low as to practically make it legal. Um, where disdain for women is so great that uh, the murderers of women get their charges reduced to manslaughter and their sentences slashed to, to absolutely nothing. Um, so it's no surprise really, no surprise at all, that domestic abuse and femicide are on the rise. Um, and to capital, the women whose lives are lost, lost to femicide are just collateral damage. They are a price that the ruling class are more than willing to pay in order to maintain ideological and material control over sexual and social reproduction. So what's to be done? Um, it would be useless to have a Marxist analysis of these problems if it doesn't present us with a radical response. So as women's oppression is integral to reproducing class society. And as women's oppression is upheld by sexist ideologies held by the proletarian masses, women's politics presents us a unique arena of opportunity for communists and anti-capitalists to disrupt the reproduction of class society. By working to, um, to quash sexist ideologies amongst our sizable class, we can reduce the inevitability that women will always be funneled into those roles which produce and reproduce class society. And um, it's particularly relevant at the moment as our hopes of an electoral road to socialism dwindle, we need to be citing out all potential areas of revolutionary struggle and women's politics is one of them. So women's liberation is not a product of revolution but it's a struggle which can ignite revolution. And that, that's me done, Mary, thanks. 
don't stop. <laughs> brilliant, a brilliant expose of the uh, of class society and how women fit into it. Thank you very much, Laura. And it's always good to have that when we are reflecting on what we need to do to transform society. Uh, because an analysis, a Marxist analysis, uh, brings, takes us away from just realizing that, you know, women are victims. We need to see, go beyond that. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, I think that Jess Duggan is here. And Jess, you have a message of solidarity from the Young Communist Lead League. And it'd be very good to have it here. Off you go, Jess. Great, thank you, Mary. Um, yep, yeah, so the, the YCL sends messages of solidarity to all our sisters across the world, including our young sisters in Turkey and Kurdistan. We know that very young women face sexual abuse and have been raped and murdered just for being women. As well as women in the UK, where we see the impact of the coronavirus lockdowns and they are having worsening effects on the domestic violence rates. As well as this, rape convictions have reached record lows. The YCL believes that solidarity and campaigning to ensure that perpetrators of these horrendous crimes are punished and it's urgent. Women should never be blamed for the actions of male offenders, which we are continuing to see within the criminal justice system as well as in the media. We aim to fight for a socialist society where women's rights are protected so that they don't suffer from being victims of patriarchy and misogyny and it's ever it's more urgent than ever. Thank you. Thank you Jess, brilliant. Thank you very much. I would like now to invite questions and contributions. You know that you've got a blue hand at the bottom of your participants box and that enables me to call you in uh, one at a time if you want to come in. I know that Hannah, you've got a message. Do you want to come bring it in now while we're waiting for the hands to go up, Hannah? Yeah, and, uh, I'm Hannah, I'm North London uh, Women's Organiser and it's great to see so many people here at this meeting. Um, and I'm, all I'm gonna say is that um, the branch, our branch, sends solidarity to our Turkish and Kurdish sisters who are suffering and fighting against domestic violence, femicide and its causes. Thanks everyone for being Thank here. Thank you, Hannah. Brilliant. Okay, no hands have come up, no questions. Wow. So obviously everything is fine. I know that Derman has got more to say, but before uh, before uh, calling on Derman, uh, Steve has asked me to read the message. It's a message of solidarity from journalists for democracy in Turkey and Kurdistan. Um, they congratulate the North London branch for organizing this important meeting on femicide in Turkey and around the world. Uh, we were founded last year following a motion from the Morningstar NUJ Chapel and launched with the support of Jim, Jim News founder and internationally acclaimed award-winning artist Zera Dogan. The attacks on women in Turkey are an attack on us all and we stand in solidarity with those fighting for freedom and women's rights. Earlier this year, Mesopotamian women journalist platform spokesman Ayşe Gune was one of those detained as women's organizations were targeted in state operations. We also remember former Atilim editor Atice Duban, Turkey's forgotten journalist, who's believed to be the worst longest, world's longest jailed reporter, journalist for democracy in Turkey and Kurdistan, continues to demand her immediate release. Journalists for democracy in Turkey and Kurdistan stand in solidarity with those fighting against femicide, rape and sexual violence in Turkey. Thank you, Steve, for bringing this up. Um, I'm going to look at the participants box. I've got Jen has got her hand up. Jen, off you go. I've got a question for Laura on this idea that um, the femicide is ideological. I mean, obviously it is, but given the fact that we know that a woman is most likely to be killed when she uh, leaves her partner within the within the 12 months of breaking up, um, with him, doesn't that mean that anyway, the possibility of 
uh, a relationship whereby he, you know, has sexual access, um, he can sort of get out of her um, a baby, all these things that you might want. Isn't it really when that window is for like is foreclosed that then this increases um, the possibility that actually it's it's sort of just a reaction to like a loss a loss of control. So I see it still as tied into the material control of women's sexual reproduction. That actually once that is um, you know foreclosed, it's kind of just like a punishment thing, and it works then as a sign and signal to other women that if you don't stay under male control this is what can happen. And if that seems to be the universal um, aspect um, in Turkey, in Britain, it is this um, 12 month window where it's at its height. Um, so is it, is it not also quite material directly? Do you want to come in, Laura, here? Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. Um, and it's interesting in the uh, most recent femicide report, which I think was 2018, um, the statistics show that the um, age bracket for um, femicide is um, at, at like women's most fertile, marriable age. So yeah, it does appear to be with that 12 month window that when fertile women of like eligible marriage age withdraw um, you know their complicity to men, they leave essentially or they are unfaithful. Um, that that is when they become victims of domestic violence. So yeah, um, I think that there is this sort of interplay of uh, material and ideological. So the fact that um, men sort of carry out this punishment, as you described it, which it does seem to be a sort of uh, punishment for daring to leave, um, is fed into by, you know, like the ideological that comes from uh, porn. I mean, we see like literal punishment porn um, and that there is sort of like a symbiotic relationship between the two. But yeah, I agree. I have a question. I have a question for Derman, actually. Derman, my question is about the Istanbul Convention. I was told that the Istanbul Convention is not worth the paper it's written on. So I'm very interested that your, your women's group are fighting for it as an important piece of legislation that can support your, your women's rights. I know that Britain has uh, signed up to the, the Istanbul Convention, although it's not ratified it. I believe that the Turkish government signed up to it and ratified it. it, was the first government to sign up to it. So I'd like you to say a little bit more about this uh, view that the Istanbul Convention is not worth the paper it's written on. Would you, would you be able to, to enlighten me on this, please? Thank you for the question. Uh, as far as I understand, you say it's just a piece of paper, if I'm not uh, wrong, right? You say uh, we shouldn't... Uh... It means it's not important. Okay, okay. Uh, yes, we know uh, if the government signs something, we know that it's just a uh, bureaucracy or it's just a small paper which they won't turn back and apply, but we insist all on this because uh, if it is really applied, uh, it's applied appropriately, we know that uh, the government will take responsibility and uh, they will uh, just be on the side of women because they will uh, put the men who rape or kill women. And actually we hope this, the thing you say is true, but uh, the government does not take any responsibility on uh, children and women abuse, on sexual abuse. So uh, all, always we as women try to do something. And it's really now very high. The number is very high that we cannot uh, just reach out every scream or every lost woman or every case or every trial, every rape, etc. So uh, we call actually the government to look back at the convention, apply it, and then uh, by uh, numbers, in numbers, uh, we hope to be lower in femicides. I agree with you, it's a paper, but uh, we hope they will apply it and the government will take responsibility 
and also uh, they will let us take responsibility because we really can't do anything now they don't do anything and they don't let us do something for our lives uh, although i agree with you we uh, hope uh, they will take responsibility by uh, applying the convention actually i hope this is the answer to your question so uh, it is an interesting answer it's always about how you use legislation even though you know legislation can be limited in its impact but however it's there and you've got to try and make it work for you i think ruth styles you've got your hand up Ruth, are you yes, there? I just wanted to ask um, a question of Zovan and Derman, actually, about what practical steps that women, and particularly communist women, could take that would support their struggle um, back in Turkey and in Kurdistan, because uh, I'm struggling to look at what would be the way in which I could do something practically uh, that would assist in that struggle. I can raise it with people. But I think we need some organizational ideas about how we might take that forward. Can you answer that, Derman? Do you want it from uh, Ruth? Do you want uh, Suzanne and Derman to answer? That would be very helpful, yes. All right. So, shall we start with Suzanne this time? Is that OK? And then Derman? Yes, that's fine. Off you go. Thank you. Thank you so much for your question, which is important to be in solidarity, actually. So, and as I mentioned about uh, some campaigns, like one of them was called social, social media campaigns, really helpful. And also uh, organizations and organize, if women organize strongly and gather and do something together, I think, I think it's very important. That's why in this case, I'm trying to build and grow the platform called Kurdish Women Podcast. It's not just only a podcast. It's something we want to bring and then actually interact and introduce Kurdish women all around to all around the world with different topics. So, and uh, in, this, in this case, like using social medias and then raising solidarities and campaign and then uh, with, uh, with um, organizations. So if you have any organization in the UK or any other countries, you can get in touch. And so it's all about pushing government and bring justice to uh, victims and also prevent the future, uh, future femicide. And uh, yeah, that, that's, that will be good to actually stay in solidarity and show then how to change the uh, laws and system and completely. I know it's difficult, it's hard, and I grew up under that system and it pushed me so much. And I was always reminded that I am a woman, woman and then I don't have rights. And then I fought for my rights all, all my life. And I'm still fighting in a different way in the UK. And then I still get this notice from like my colleagues and then working as a journalist in an environment which is so difficult. We try to that, that in this way, we try to raise women voices. Thank you, Suzanne. Derman, in your, in your response, could you also think about the role of trade unions in Turkey, how they can help, and the role of trade unions in Britain, maybe, how we can work to build the movement of solidarity? Okay. Uh, also, Lorraine Douglas, uh, sorry, uh, Ruth Stiles, yes, uh, says uh, she wants to hear more about the support. Uh, I will connect all of them. And also I want to thank you for solidarity greetings. I cannot read now all of them, but thank you very much. It's really very nice uh, for us. I will also tell my sisters of these messages. Uh, thank you, uh, Ruth, for your question uh, also. As I said, uh, Mary, to her question, of course we don't depend on the papers. And of course we don't really trust government. Uh, that's uh, why I'm here. I'm out on the streets. Yeah, this is the truth. As uh, before, I want to say this. But we want to call the government to take uh, its responsibility and to save or to protect lives. At least uh, it has the power of money and we don't have the power of uh, something, of course, and we cannot really reach uh, everywhere. So uh, this is the first thing I want to say. And what we do here, 
is that first of all, uh, we know the importance of street all the time, because if we don't go out to streets, uh, we are put into houses and we are uh, left without solidarity, left without touching each other. Uh, although there is pandemia, we try to go out to streets and uh, my sisters are uh, giving some uh, leaflets for the 25th of uh, November. Uh, I cannot uh, go nowadays because of uh, pandemia. Also, I caught uh, with it, but uh, I'm recovering and I will be on street uh, soon again. Uh, what we do here is, as I said, uh, streets first and then we make some petitions, for example. We send uh, messages of solidarity to uh, women, especially to uh, co-chair women of HDP, because uh, all the time uh, women in the east part of Turkey of uh, HDP, HDP, are uh, taken and a new person is uh, put into uh, her place. Uh, as you know, they are taken uh, from their jobs. Uh, although we voted for them, the government doesn't uh, count our votes. So we send our messages of solidarity uh, for women under uh, in jail now uh, or under arrest. And maybe uh, as Mary said, uh, what uh, the unions, uh, trade unions, uh, what uh, the organizations in Turkey and in London can do, maybe uh, you can send messages of solidarity by writing letters. Uh, the addresses of women I have, maybe I can send you the addresses if you like, because uh, in the last meeting of Ankara Women's Platform, we talked about it and they will be really happy if uh, you can. Also, uh, my sisters and I talked about uh, if you can give messages to the refugees in Turkey, it will also be good because Istanbul Convention uh, says that uh, it doesn't uh, make any difference between women who are refugees or who are uh, from this religion or from that language or whatever. Uh, it really ensures that it will give support to any women and children uh, under violence or risk of violence. So we want this solidarity to emphasize this idea of the convention, uh, regardless of the paper of it. I mean, the idea of it is important for us. And also uh, hashtag, as Zozan said, uh, really important. Social media is really important. As you all know, we have seen the force of it because uh, after we wrote some hashtags, we could save the lives of our sisters, some of our sisters, or unfortunately, some of the women died. But again, thanks to the social media, thanks to hashtags, we could uh, warn the government that they should, uh, they should put the men into jail or uh, we warned the government that we are uh, following the case of uh, women uh, who were raped or uh, who were killed. So uh, our uh, suggestion is that on the 25th of November, we can create a hashtag together and to, to uh, raise the international solidarity uh, in London, in Turkey, in Chile, I don't know, in some countries, in many countries, uh, we can just make our voices louder. So uh, we recommend the hashtag uh, together. Maybe we can find it. Uh, yeah, and also uh, I had already suggested a chain, a women's chain uh, in London. Maybe if you can go out to streets uh, with uh, the masks and if you want, I will uh, send them to you and uh, with this chain we can say that if Istanbul Convention is applied appropriately uh, women are not going to suffer that much from uh, male violence uh, we want to uh, show the government here actually that uh, we have solidarity everywhere uh, yeah that's actually uh, all for now that I can say I hope it's enough uh, for the question. Thank you, Ruth.
Thanks, Mary. Um, okay, I'm just checking the participants box. There's no more hands up. Um, we've got time for, um, for uh, summaries now, and I'll call on our speakers to sum up how we can move forward, how they see the battle forward. Dermans made some excellent suggestions about messages. We've got messages of solidarity in the Morning Star, the possibility of having message, using hashtag, the possibility of forming a chain. It'd be quite good to have contributions about that and thinking about what we do on the 25th of November. So as there are no more participants, no more contributions, can I ask Laura to come in first, maybe? Hi, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I just want to thank um, the, the our Kurdish sisters for their contributions. It's been really insightful. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it makes me feel a bit daft um, speaking at an event when what you have to say is very, very important. Um, so yeah, as always, I think that our way forward is uh, theory and practice. So I think that we need to be developing our uh, Marxist feminist theory because that is what will provide us with radical long-term solutions to these, um, to these problems. But that does not diminish the fact that we need to be working on the ground all the time because um, women are suffering materially all the time. Um, and we cannot just tell them to sit back and wait for the revolution. Um, women are being raped and murdered as we speak um, across, across the globe. And particularly at the moment, um, we stand with our um, Kurdish sisters in, in Turkey and our sisters in Poland, um, and we need to be organising in support of them. Thank you, Laura. Suzanne? First of all, I would like to say that I really miss Istanbul March, big <laughs> March. Then one can understand me, probably. <laughs> and it was really beautiful. Every year we were on the street and then trying to do something and women power was really like great in Turkey and in Kurdistan. Um, yeah, in this case, and um, we cannot be in the street and lockdown and affect everything. So, and um, like all the, the, the things that we can do and focus on social media and focus on webinars and then reaching more people, more audiences, this is important to actually reach. In. When we do webinars, actually we, we reach so limited people, but, uh, in on social media and creating like platforms so it will help so much and then i'm also here that uh trying to do some uh, podcasts for um 25th of uh, november and yeah we will just be working and be in solidarity thank you suzanne and finally derman can you sum up and give us the direction the way forward uh, to sum up, uh, I want to say that uh, an international solidarity will be really good for uh, the women in Turkey. Uh, we are really stuck because of the racist and uh, women, the, the enemies of women, they are the enemies of women and uh, Kurdish people and all the minorities in Turkey and we really feel stuck because of also the pandemia. So uh, it will be a great uh, thing to be uh, in international solidarity. Uh, as I said, if we cannot uh, go out to streets in London, if you cannot make a chain, yes, a virtual chain or uh, a hashtag will be a good idea. Maybe uh, people in their houses write something or in Turkish, they can say, apply Istanbul Convention and uh, take a picture of it and put in the hashtag, not just using the hashtag, but also uh, a picture or a photo uh, of the person or something uh, will also be good, I guess. And as I said, uh, letters can be sent to uh, prisons. Uh, if you agree with that, we can also uh, organize a letter writing day or I don't know, people can send by uh, one by one themselves. Uh, to, make, to, to sum up, actually, uh, it's not only Istanbul Convention, it's always the case that uh, 
in Turkey, uh, women and children and minorities are not uh, valuable. They are the first things to give up. So uh, we are resisting to say that our lives are important, uh, let alone, uh, of course, Istanbul Convention. Before Istanbul Convention, this was also the case. Uh, but uh, taking the opportunity of Istanbul Convention also, and we hope that the government will take responsibility, we want to remind that our lives are important and we don't want to lose uh, no more women anymore. Uh, so we are here together, we are strong together, and thank you for again organizing this event. Uh, we feel stronger uh, today and with these uh, meetings, uh, such kind of solidarity messages. And thank you everybody for being here and listening to our voices from Turkey, uh, from Kurdistan, uh, of course, from our uh, the, the voices of our sisters. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, thank Mary. You, I'd like to conclude by saying this. I'm the Secretary of the London District of the Communist Party, and I think that uh, Laura made a very good case for why we need a Marxist feminist analysis of, the, of capitalist society. It suits capitalist society to divide us. It suits capitalist society to keep women doubly oppressed. And domestic violence is an expression of this, of this oppression. And after all, women are half of the population. Just imagine if men and women were together, fighting together for a different society. But of course it suits capitalism to keep us divided. It divides men and women, it divides black people and white people, it divides people from different ethnic origins. And, and the more division, the more uh, capitalism can thrive. And that is why we need a party like the Communist Party. And the Communist Party is unique in that it gives an anal analysis of capitalist society. So that when we go into action, we need the theory in order to inform our action. And of course, we have to have solidarity with our sisters in Turkey, our sisters in India, our sisters across the world. All our sisters are suffering in capitalist societies, are suffering from similar uh, a similar oppression and uh, contexts might be different. I mean, the situation Erdogan is pushing Muslim fundamentalist ideology, the idea of the family, the woman as the homemaker. And in Britain, that is happening as well, actually. Uh, the, the Tories are very good at this. So there are differences, but there are great similarities. So I would like to say, in the end, you know, a Marxist feminist analysis of capitalist society is key for us to understand we, the, the world we live in, why it is the way it is, and why we need to change it. So I'd like to think, thank all our speakers for coming tonight. I'd like to think, thank Derman for staying up so late. Derman was actually very ill. She had COVID, but I'm very glad she's better. I hope you're still better. Um, thank you to Laura for joining us, and thank you for Suzanne for joining us at such short notice and uh, replacing a uh, son who was going to be with us. And one of the things about son and the reason I'm sorry that um, uh, we weren't uh, joined uh, by um, our, our comrades, our comrade Sarah Jane McDonough is that Sarah Jane McDonough is a trade unionist. And I greatly believe that the organized trade union and labor movement is very important in bringing change. Because if we're all disparate individuals, we can't do very much. But if we are a trade union and bringing the, these ideas into the trade union movement is part of the struggle. And all of us, I know that Laura is an active trade unionist. I know that many of you here are active trade unionists. And we need to think about how we influence the trade union movement. I was hoping that Mary Davis was going to speak about the letter that 150 women trade unionists signed in support of uh, Turkish women, and that which was a very important initiative. Uh, and these sort of things we need to keep doing and keep going. So I think what we'll do is we'll take back uh, Derman's suggestions for ac action to our meetings. 
We have a meeting of the Women's Commission of the Communist Party soon. We also meet as a London group of women regularly to discuss how we're going to campaign and what we're going to do. And I'm certainly very glad to have the contact with you, Derman, and to keep in touch with you for future uh, opportunities and events. So comrades, thank you very much for joining this meeting. Have a wonderful evening thank and you. good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye.